Um, I, I truly believe that the experiences that we um, each have as individuals, um, the things that God reveals to us, and um, the things that we learn are meant not just for ourselves, um, but that we're meant to share them with each other. And the things that George and I learned and experienced and saw um, were not just for us, but for you guys, too. Uh, and so my prayer and my hope this morning, um, as I talk for a little bit and just share, um, is that, first of all, just that God would be glorified, that um, all of us together in this room can um, magnify God and praise him and worship him for the amazing things that he is doing um, around the world, what he's done in each of our lives. Um, and so I just want to celebrate God together and praise him publicly for what he is doing and what he's done. Um, and then also, um, I hope that you are encouraged um, and challenged, hopefully, by some of the things that um, God personally has been uh, teaching me that I've experienced recently. Um, and so this is going to be a little bit more of a less formal setting. Um, I wish that I could literally sit down with a cup of coffee with each one of you <laughs> and just have a conversation because that's more my style. Um, so I'm just going to pretend like we're uh, all sitting around in a coffee shop right now um, having a conversation about China. Um, so let me, uh, let me pray for us this morning. Father, um, as we sang earlier, you are able um, above and beyond anything we can ask or imagine. Um, you are the living God. And we praise you, we worship you, we honor you. I ask that your name would be lifted high um, as I speak about you this morning. Um, and Lord, that our hearts would be soft and open to the Holy Spirit speaking to each of us. Um, that you would teach us and comfort us and encourage us and challenge us. And it's in Jesus' name that I pray these things. Amen. Um, so I want to start this morning by just reading uh, Psalm 111. Um, I feel like this psalm, I'm going to be kind of all over the place, so if you want to pull out your Bibles or your phones um, and follow along with me, I'm going to start in Psalm 111. Um, I feel like this psalm really encapsulates um, just how, honestly, how I feel about God right now. <laughs> so uh, here we go. Um, psalm 111. Hallelujah. I will praise the Lord with all my heart in the assembly of the upright and in the congregation. The Lord's works are great, studied by all who delight in them. All that he does is splendid and majestic. His righteousness endures forever. He has caused his wonderful works to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and compassionate. He has provided food for those who fear him. He remembers his covenant forever. He has shown his people the power of his works by giving them the inheritance of the nations. The work of his hands are truth and justice. All his instructions are trustworthy. They are established forever and ever, enacted in truth and in what is right. He has sent redemption to his people. He has ordained his covenant forever. His name is holy and awe-inspiring. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All who follow his instructions have good insight. His praise endures forever. The word of the Lord. So um, George and I, uh, it was kind of a last minute trip for us. Um, I felt somewhat of a prompting, what I believe is the prompting of the Holy Spirit um, to go. Uh, we have friends there who are long-term missionaries there. They've lived there for 10 years, more than 10 years. I don't know exactly what the number is, um, but so they're China veterans. Um, and they are amazing, just a wonderful family. Um, and George and I uh, decided to go and visit them and partner with them and with their team just to see what God was doing in China um, and to really spend some um, significant time seeking God 
um, and just seeking to hear from him for our lives as well. Um, and so just a little uh, background, um, we were in Chengdu, which is a city, a small city for China of just 14 million people. Um, it's the largest uh, city in western China, um, kind of just north of India and east of Tibet. Um, and it's a hub for many um, minority people groups in China. So um, I'm pretty ignorant about China. <laughs> I was before I went. Um, and I think in the US, we tend to think of China as like one group of people. Um, when in reality, there is a ton of diversity in China. Um, and there are several minority people groups that specifically um, tend to come to Chengdu because it's closer than going all the way um, to the east in Beijing and Shanghai. Um, and so there are um, many of the missionaries in Chengdu are reaching out to these minority people groups. Um, and so I just want to share with you a little bit about what God is doing in China um, because it was, I was really blown away um, by just all the different ways that God is moving and working there. Um, so first of all, there is a people group called the Uyghurs, um, and they live in Xinjiang province, which is northwest China. And they are actually a Turkic um, Muslim people group. Um, there are actually more Muslims in China than there are in Saudi Arabia, which I had no idea <laughs> before I went. Um, but these people are um, really actually oppressed by the Chinese government, um, by the majority, uh, by the Han Chinese, um, and there's a lot of division among them. So it's a similar, not exactly the same, but a similar situation as the Israel-Palestinian conflict, um, where they really hate each other. Um, and there's a lot of dispute over land uh, ownership and um, there's a large military presence in Xinjiang um, that has recently, they've really clamped down on them. Um, so there's security going into malls, there's security getting on buses, there's constantly people, um, you know, police stopping and asking you for your papers. Um, and many Uyghurs are not given passports to leave the country. Um, they're not given permission to travel. Um, and so they feel very oppressed, um, especially right now, and there's a lot of conflict between the two um, people groups. And so this, um, this group of people, um, honestly, right now, uh, God is really softening their hearts um, because of the oppression. So uh, we had a chance to spend some time with a Uyghur girl who just um, graduated college um, in Chengdu. And she was telling us about her home back in Xinjiang, and she literally started like tearing up because she felt so, um, she was like, I just want to be free. And um, those words were really powerful to me because she was speaking um, from a physical sense of wanting to be free from the oppression in her area. But, um, you know, as she said that, I felt like it was spiritual, you know, that she, she longs for freedom and the freedom that we can only have um, through Jesus Christ. And so um, her name was Majda. Uh, we got to hang out with her a few times. Um, they do something at the university um, every Friday night. Well, they love to dance in China. Um, and if any of you guys know me, I'm, I'm not really a dancer. <laughs> um, I grew up kind of in like the Baptist type tradition and didn't really dance growing up. And so I'm a really awkward dancer. Um, and I feel like every time we've been on the mission field, God's like, dance, dance for Jesus. And <laughs> I'm like, uh, only for Jesus. So um, we did a lot of dancing. Um, but I got to just dance with her um, for probably about an hour and a half on a Friday night. Um, you know, it was kind of like an Arab style dancing. You have like the hands and stuff. Um, and I was terrible, uh, but we, we just had a blast and we really connected. And um, 
I really believe that her heart is soft um, towards Jesus, and she has a few friends um, in Chengdu who have recently become believers. And uh, the missionaries there, Nova and Ira, um, have recently started the first Uyghur church in Chengdu. Um, There are three young ladies uh, who are meeting together on Friday nights, Um, to worship Jesus and be discipled and learn more. And so we're praying for that, um, for that church, that men will come to know Jesus and that that church will grow, um, grow and grow and grow. And so just there's a lot of fertile soil right now in the hearts of Uyghurs. um, And, you know, coming from that, um, just coming from that Muslim background, um, they're so enslaved spiritually and physically right now um, and they need Jesus and uh, God is opening doors for people uh, for missionaries to go into Xinjiang um, and also for um, young people who are coming out of Xinjiang and going to university to come to know Jesus and going back and sharing the gospel in their communities Um, so that's a place George and I didn't get a chance to uh, actually go to Xinjiang Um, But we really, really want to. So (laughs) if you would pray with us uh, in the future, we feel like we would really love to go up into that area um, to share Jesus. Um, So there are a lot of Uyghurs uh, in Chengdu, and there are also a ton of Tibetans. Um, George and I lived on a street that was uh, highly Tibetan. Um, As you just walk the streets of China, I was... I don't know why I was surprised, but I was surprised by the amount of um, monks just everywhere. (laughs) They were um, just, you know, walking down the street like um, you or me, but you could tell by their clothing that they were monks, and um, they they were everywhere. So not just in the temples, but you know, walking the streets, in the restaurants, um, on the subway, (laughs) like everywhere. Um, And so I didn't know a lot about. Buddhism, and I still don't claim to know a lot about Buddhism, so (laughs) uh, I'm not an expert, but um, we had the opportunity to go to several uh, Buddhist temples uh, and just walk around and pray, Um, pray for the people who were there, pray for um, the monks and the people who were visiting, Um, and it was a really powerful uh, experience for me because... um, First of all, the idols that were there, um, if you just Google, like, Buddhist gods and look up, you know, click on images, um, they are all, the vast majority of them, like, they're really scary. (laughs) It's like dragons and, like, really fierce um, images. And um, so much of Buddhism is rooted in fear. It's fear-based and trying to um, overcome that and rise above that. Um, And so it was really humbling and sad for me to um, watch people going to the temple, um, giving their money, uh, literally bowing down to idols, um, which we don't experience as much of that actual physical like idol worship here in America. but there is like, we went to one temple and there was a girl who was probably about five or six and she just went up and knelt before this idol and, and bowed before him. And my heart was just like crushed because she doesn't know. She doesn't know anything different and she's this little girl and um, she's growing up in fear, living in fear and with no real promise of freedom. Um, and so, uh, all that to say, <laughs> um, there are there are a lot of um, Tibetans who who need Jesus. But um, much like Islam, uh, people can't leave Buddhism without severe consequences from their families. Um, and so, if you are Tibetan, um, your firstborn child is automatically given to the monastery, um, whether it's a um, a boy or a girl, they don't have any choice in it. Um, and so they grow up uh, in the monastery. Um, and then the whole family is Buddhist. And so we had the opportunity to spend some time with a guy named Wesley, um, who has 
uh, spent time with the missionary team there. He's witnessed miracles. He's heard about Jesus. He's open to the gospel. But his older brother is a monk, and um, if he chose Jesus, his family would really would disown him. Um, and so I don't think we realize that this is um, the case with, at least with Tibetan Buddhism, um, that it's that intense. Um, so anyway, there are a lot of people working uh, with Tibetans. It's, it's directly um, to the west of Chengdu, and so there are a lot of Tibetans that come and go. And they also, um, if you're familiar with history at all between Tibet and China and that whole conflict, they also feel oppressed. They're also not allowed to leave. They aren't given passports. Um, and so these types of conversations actually open up doors for the gospel. Um, we found that to be true in Palestine, and I think the same is true in China, um, that when people, they want to talk about their oppression, <laughs> um, then it opens up doors to talk about um, spiritual things really easily. Um, and then finally, um, this is not the only other minority people group, but it's the one that we had contact with. Um, they're the Chong people. Um, and they live in between Tibet and Chengdu. Um, and they're very, very old people group. Um, we had the opportunity to go out to a Chong village and stay there. Um, and the oldest home in that village is over 2,000 years old. So that village existed when Jesus was walking the earth, which is pretty awesome. Um, God is really, he's moving in the Chong people. I, I don't know <laughs> what he's doing, but missionary teams have been going out and staying in villages, and they have seen um, literally entire villages healed. Um, people coming to Christ through that, um, just in the village square, uh, everyone coming like, where's the doctor? And they're like, we're not doctors. <laughs> we just, we know Jesus, and Jesus can heal you. And, um, and then he does, and they come to know Jesus. Um, and so that is just amazing. Um, and we had the opportunity to stay with the Chong family um, who are not believers yet. And um, we had the opportunity to pray with them, to eat with them, um, to pray over them, and also to sing with them. <laughs> so uh, in Chinese culture, <laughs> I'm a little more comfortable singing than dancing, so this is okay. Um, but in Chinese culture, it's um, not abnormal for someone in the middle of a meal or you're just hanging out and they're like, sing me a song. And you're like, okay. <laughs> um, and so uh, you could be anywhere. Like uh, our last night in China, George and I were eating street barbecue and we're literally sitting on the sidewalk of like a really busy street. And um, the guy who owns the stand sat down with us and then just like belted a song in the middle of everything. <laughs> so it was very normal there, but it was awesome because um, you know people who had asked us to sing didn't necessarily know English. Um, and so we had the freedom to sing whatever we wanted. And so uh, in all sorts of places, we were just worshiping Jesus um, because whenever they would ask us to sing, we would just worship God. <laughs> And so in this home, you know, where we were eating a meal, and he's like, sing a song. And so we did. We were able to worship Jesus in that place, um, which I think is really powerful. Um, and also, so for me, just being, um, if you have the chance, if you're Facebook friends with me, sorry, I didn't get pictures for this today, but um, there's some pictures of the mountains that we were in, of the village. And, um, you know, there's mountains all over, all over the scriptures. Um, and it talks about how God created the mountains and the mountains show his strength and his power and invoke awe and wonder. And having lived in Dallas for the last three years and then going and these mountains were like, oh my gosh. Like we were driving in a van that had windows in the like top of the van and I had to look through like the top to see the top of the mountains. Um, so it was just, incredibly refreshing um, spiritually to be in that environment and be reminded of God's power um, and just his, yeah, his amazingness um, as creator um, and what he is capable um, of doing. So we also had, an, we had um, another 
another experience there that I'm going to come back to later. Um, but I just wanted to share also, so God, he's working in the minority groups. Um, they're seeing people are coming to Jesus. Um, but also in the Han Chinese, um, many of you probably know that the underground church there is exploding. Um, and those who are believers, it's been several years now since that wave kind of started happening. And those believers are being discipled and they're growing in their faith and they want to share their faith. Um, and they want to go out and be missionaries but they don't know how to do it. And so um, several of the people that, um, of the missionaries there in Chengdu partner with local Han believers um, to send teams of people out to share the gospel. Um, and so Chinese believers are going to India and Turkey, Israel and Pakistan um, to share Jesus. And many believe that the Chinese are strategically placed to reach the Muslim world for Jesus. Um, because, you know, they're not, Chinese aren't, aren't pegged as believers. Like Westerners go over into Muslim countries and they automatically are suspicious and think, oh, you're a Christian and you're trying to convert us. Um, but Chinese aren't, aren't viewed that way. Um, and so they have a unique opportunity to build relationship without that automatic suspicion of you're trying to convert me. Um, and so it's amazing. Obviously, there are so many more Chinese that need to come to Jesus, and we're, we should still be sending missionaries there. But God is raising up the church in China to reach the world as well. Um, and I think it won't be long before there are more Chinese being sent out than there are Americans being sent out. Um, so that's awesome. And um, one other really unique thing, so God does like crazy things, right? Things that we could never imagine. Um, and George and I got to spend a morning at a place called the Shalom House. Um, in this place, there are Chinese believers that are learning modern Hebrew in order to share Jesus with Israelis who come to China. So they've opened up their homes um, a lot of Israelis, they, after they finish their term in the army, in the military, they're given leave for a while to go on like a trip. And a lot of them go up into India and China and they're looking, they're searching for um, peace, really, because they've experienced what they've experienced in the military. They're trying to come to grips with that. And so what the Shalom House does is offers free housing for them to stay in exchange for Hebrew lessons, modern Hebrew lessons. And so, um, and these Israelis are so blown away by Chinese learning modern Hebrew because modern Hebrew is not like, it's not a language that it makes sense to learn, okay? <laughs> so like if you're gonna learn another language, right, like and you're Chinese, you should learn English or you should learn Spanish or something that's gonna like help you move up in the world, right, that's gonna look good on your resume, that's gonna allow you to communicate with the most amount of people, right? But these believers have learned modern Hebrew specifically so that they can speak the heart language um, of the Israelis and say, I care about you. Jesus cares about you um, so much that he would, you know, lead a Chinese person to learn modern Hebrew <laughs> um, for you. And so uh, many Israelis are hearing the gospel through Chinese believers, which is just, it just blows my mind. And so for George and I, it was a really um, amazing experience because we weren't able to speak directly to a lot of um, Chinese people. We don't know any Chinese except for hello and thank you. And, uh, and, but we walked into Shalom House and George was able to just like, oh, we're talking in Hebrew. <laughs> and it was such this like out of body experience because like we're in China, we're speaking Hebrew, like what is happening? Um, but that's what God does. Like he, I could never come up with that at all, ever in my mind. And, and yet God is like, this is how I wanna reach Israelis. Um, at least one way that I wanna do it. And so, um, so I'm just, I, I came back from this trip and um, was so encouraged to see just God at work and that people are becoming, are coming to Jesus um, and that there's um, light and hope and, 
I think we hear so often about China in like a negative sense, um, that it's like very dark there, that there's so much, you know, government control and there's not a lot of freedom and, you know, the police are everywhere and you have to be so careful. But we went and we just um, experienced the joy, like the, the joy of God and saw him moving and working so clearly. Um, and so there's that. And then there are just several ways that God um, really challenged me and encouraged me. Um, and the first one is that, you know, here in Dallas, we're around, we're in the Bible Belt, and we're around believers, like, a lot of the time, right? Many of you, I mean, you have different work situations, but for me personally, I work in a Christian environment, and then we're here at Loft, and um, I love you all, but I'm around believers, like, the majority of the time. Um, and then even when we're not around believers, we're around people who oftentimes claim Jesus, um, claim Christianity, um, and it's just, it's just a different atmosphere. Um, and so when I went to China, um, some of those experiences, like in the Tibetan temples, um, and even just walking down the street, and I tried to make a point of just looking into people's faces, um, looking in their eyes, and I feel like God, you know, allows you to kind of sense um, where they're at spiritually, and there's just so much darkness, so much despair, um, so much hopelessness. Um, people who are just lost in the sea of people in China um, who feel like they have no, um, they aren't special at all, they have nothing to offer, they'll never amount to anything, um, and they have no hope, they have no way out. Um, and I was just overwhelmed <laughs> with renewed joy at my salvation um, because God has rescued me um, from darkness into light. And um, I was just reminded of the amazing gift that that is, that I take that for granted every day. <laughs> I really do. And, um, you know, we whine and we complain about little inconveniences and, um, you know, all these little things in our lives, but we lose sight of the fact that God himself has rescued us, um, that we're adopted and we're loved and forgiven and redeemed. Um, and I just want to read for you um, Colossians chapter 1, because I feel like it kind of sums this up. Um, chapter 1, starting in verse 11, says, May you be strengthened with all power, according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience, with joy giving thanks to the Father who has enabled you to share in the saints' inheritance in the light. He has rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of the Son he loves. We have redemption, the forgiveness of sins in him. So I was, I was just reminded of honestly my salvation and just that brings such amazing joy when I remember you know who I was as a slave you know enslaved to my my own sin um, my own flesh and enslaved to Satan honestly um, and I had no freedom and I had no hope and Jesus died for me, that I would be reconciled to God, and I have a relationship with God, like the living God. Um, and as you watch people bow down to idols, um, they're desperate for a God who can help them. Um, there's one idol that has like 20 different arms coming out of it in the back, like with all these different hands. Um, and I feel like it just points to the fact that um, people want a God who can do something, right? Who has hands, who is able to be involved and in their lives. And, and we have that. We have a God, the living God, who, who cares personally about each and every one of us and what's happening in our lives in the immediate, like all of the small things and also 
on the large scale. And um, so I think that was kind of the first step for me was just being overwhelmed with joy at what God has done for me and that I, and that I am saved. Um, but then I started thinking more um, and like, what does that mean, right? So I'm saved, um, but it's not just that my sins have been forgiven. It's not just that I'm going to heaven and I'm not going to hell. Um, I think there's a complete identity change that makes every difference in the world for here and now and how we live in this earth. And so like, while I was a slave, I'm now a child of God. And God is, he is the king, right? He has access to the cattle on a thousand hills. He is generous and he's good and he's trustworthy and he loves us and he's the father who throws a feast for us, right, when we come home. And I think that all too often we're saved, but we keep wearing our rags and we keep, you know, washing the dishes and, and we're still walking in slavery when we're sons and daughters of the living God. And I just want to encourage you this morning um, to, to run to God as your father, to see him as, as he is, as generous and good and involved in, in every area of your life and as wanting to bless you and wanting to speak to you and wanting to give you good gifts. And, and he has, because he's given us access, right? The Holy Spirit lives inside of us. And we say that, but do we believe it? Do we live it out? So, like, do we believe that the Holy Spirit speaks to us? And that the Holy Spirit is capable of guiding us and teaching us and all of these things that we say, right? But as Sean said in his sermon last week, like, we don't ask. We don't ask for anything. God is, is longing for us to come out of our slavery, and, and he wants to just bless us, and yet we're just, we're just walking in our, old, in our old self. And there's so much joy and freedom and belonging in the family of God when you start seeing yourself as a child instead of a slave, that it changes everything. And there's joy to be found in everything. Um, and so this is the real area for me that I was just, God really just rocked my world because he showed me that there were areas where I wasn't, I wasn't, I was trusting him, but I didn't believe that he was good. You know, I was like, you can, you can sustain me, but God wants us to do more than just survive. Like he wants us to thrive and he's given us everything that we need to do that. And so um, I think so often we have this mindset of scarcity. And this is, this is me. Like, I don't have enough time. I haven't had enough sleep. I don't have enough resources. We don't have enough money. You know, and we're constantly operating in this headspace of, like, I don't have enough. And God is like you like with God there is always enough and more and we don't to do what he has called us to do right that's the that's the caveat there um, but it's an amazing one because when we're walking in God's will when we're seeking him and listening to him and following him and walking in his freedom and his joy and we have that freedom to do whatever he asks us because we believe that he provides for us over and above whatever we could imagine, there's, that is where the abundant life that Jesus promises is. And um, so I think just coming back to who is this God that we call Father, he's present and actively involved in every aspect of our lives. He is good, and he's calling us to trust him. Those of you who are parents um, know that you would do anything for your kid. You want the best for them, right? But God knows 
what the absolute best is for each of us, and he's able to give it to us. We strain and struggle and work our way through our lives without ever stopping to ask God for his will and his provision. We cut our own path through the bush instead of following the path he's already made for us. And so, I mean, there were a million things that happened on the trip, a million ways that God kind of confirmed this, and it was little pieces coming together. Um, At the beginning of the trip, you know, I said, I felt the prompting of the Holy Spirit to go, and so we booked tickets, even though we didn't have money, and, um, and then I started freaking out, because I was like, what did I do? I'm irresponsible, and this is, you know, like, this is dumb. We don't have money to go to China. And then God was like, here, here's your money. And um, it was amazing. Like, he just, he provided for us, like, for our plane tickets. He provided even spending money while we were there. Um, and that's just, like, a teeny way that he provides for us. Like, he has access to everything. Everything is his. Um, do we really believe that? So I want to um, share with you one final story. Um, and it happened when we were up in the Chong village. Um, we spent the night there, and then we were uh, coming back down from the mountain. And we were up pretty far, so it was like, you know, a small road, switchbacks all the way up and, and back. Um, and on the day we were supposed to come back, Um, the driver who was supposed to come pick us up called us and said, you know, I can't get through. Essentially, there was a truck in the road. Um, They were transporting cows and bulls that day, and he couldn't get past it because it was just like, you know, the mountain up and the mountain down and then like a little road. And so we found another van um, to try and bring us down the mountain to meet at that spot, and then we had to walk past the truck and get in another van to go the rest of the way. Um, And you know, this is just classic. You're in literally the middle of nowhere. (laughs) Um, And so anyway, so we're doing this, and you know, we get out of the van, and we're just kind of meandering down the road, and um, you know, a lot of the people there, some of them, they're wanting to take our pictures, you know, because in the city, they've seen white people, most people, but out in the villages, you know, they're like, ooh, white person, selfie. And you're like, oh, okay. <laughs> so we're celebrities out in, you know, Chong villages. Um, so anyway, so we're just taking our time and um, I'm walking down the road and all of a sudden um, I hear this voice in my head and, uh, and it says, um, not in my head. I actually heard an audible voice. I don't know why I said that. Um, and it said, uh, run, the bull is loose. And so I ran. Um, so I turned around and started running, and, um, and I felt like, I thought George was near me, and I felt like he was behind me, and I had this sense that he was like trying to protect me, um, but he was actually like impeding my ability to run, and I was really frustrated <laughs> in my head. <laughs> it's like, you're going to kill us both. Um, and then I felt someone push me. And I fell, like, face down on the road. And, I, you know, you're running from a bull. You're terrified. So your instinct is to, like, get up and keep going, right? And, um, and so, but I, like, couldn't move. I couldn't get up. I felt, like, pinned to the ground. And seconds later, Ira, um, who was one of the missionaries there, he's, like, 6'5", you know, super athletic, he falls right next to me. And we're like shoulder to shoulder on the road, and I can't move, neither of us can get up. And so I turn around to look, and I see the bull, and it like changes direction (laughs) and charges straight for us. And I'm not going to lie. I mean, George says, I don't remember, but George says at this point I was sc- started screaming. <laughs> um, and, you know, in my head I'm going through like, okay, you know, if I'm going I'm to get trampled by a bull, like, I'm going to die. Like, if he, hits, if he steps on my head, I'm dead. If he steps on my spine, I'm dead. If he steps on my hand, it's crushed. Like, you know, there's no good scenario here. And so in my head, like, after going through that, I'm just like, Jesus. And, um... So <laughs> it's terrifying. This bull is over 2,000 pounds. Um, biggest bull I've ever seen in my life. 
is charging straight for us. And then I watched as um, the bull trampled my friend, Ira, who was laying right next to me. And it kept running up the road, the bull, and as soon as it was past us, um, you know, I was freaking out. I thought that Ira was at the very least seriously injured. He might be dead, like, I don't know. And, um, and we both like pop up and I'm still screaming and he's like, I'm fine. I'm fine, I'm fine. <laughs> I was like, I didn't believe him. <laughs> um, and so we kind of like got to safety real quickly. Um, and, and he was like, at first he was saying, I think it just like clipped my shoulder, but like I'm not hurt at all. And so, um, but in my mind, I was like inches away and like saw the bull run over him. So something wasn't adding up in my mind. Um, and so we're kind of, but even then we're like, wow, like the bull ran right over us and like didn't hit us. That's crazy, you know? But then later Ira took his shirt off and he had um, hoof marks, um, <laughs> one directly like over his spine on his lower back, another one like on his side. Um, and then another one like on his shoulder, um, but it was just scratches. There was no, no bruises, no injury, like he was completely fine. Um, it was actually like we both had some scrapes and bruises from like falling on the road and that those were the worst <laughs> injuries that either of us had. Um, and so, yeah, wow. So. Um, we were kind of talking about it, like debriefing about it, and um, there were six of us Americans there. And, um, and Ira started asking, he was like, who yelled? Like, I heard, you know, run, the bull is loose. Like, who yelled that? And all of us were like, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, you know? And nobody yelled it. Um, only four of us heard it in perfect English. Um, no one speaks English up there. Um, George heard someone yell something in Chinese, so either like gift of tongues or just audible voice of God, I don't know, <laughs> um, but it was miraculous. And, um, and then I, when I got up, I went straight to George and I was like, George, like what were you thinking? <laughs> you know, like I appreciate trying to protect me, but like what were you thinking? And he was like, I wasn't anywhere close to you. Like he was on the other side of the road and um, and Michelle was like, yeah, like there was no one behind you. Like there was no one near you. And, um, and Ira was, it was the same thing. He felt pushed down to the ground and then he was pinned and like couldn't get up. And um, so something pushed us to the ground <laughs> um, and held us there. And Ira and I were both um, uh, later on, we're kind of praying about it and um, both saw an image of like an angelic being laying on top of us. Um, so God just like, the whole thing took, was like 10 seconds, you know, 10 or 15 seconds, like bulls run really, really fast. There's no way I could have outrun it. And there was nowhere to go. Um, it was just like straight up the mountain or like a guardrail and then like a 10, 15 foot drop. So George almost <laughs> jumped over the guardrail. I'm thankful he didn't. <laughs> <laughs> um, the bull changed direction at the last second. Um, but I share this story with you guys because um, it's just, just a reminder that God is a living God, right? So, um, you know, these people are going to the Buddhist temples, they're worshiping these idols, and as Psalm 115 says, like, they have hands, but they can't do anything. They have eyes, but they can't see. They have mouths, but they can't speak. They have ears, but they can't hear. And those who put their trust in them are fools, right? But our God is the living God, and he can hear and see and do. And those who put their trust in him are wise, right? We have every reason to, to put all of our trust in every situation in God because he can do anything and he often works and moves I think in ways that um, you know may seem more normal to us right he protects us and he provides for us and all of these things every day and we just don't see it um, but it's in these certain situations where the hand of God is so evident um, 
that we can look at what happened with the bull and say, God, he cares for me, um, that I'm his child, and he can protect me from anything. And I don't know what's going to happen any second of any day. I can plan and you know, worry and all these things. And, you know, in 60 seconds, a bull could come charging through. Um, And so you just, you just, we don't know, right? We think we're in control and we're not. Um, And we put our trust in ourselves and there's nothing we can do in these situations um, but trust in God. And so um, if God can take a situation like that and protect us from a bull, he can also um, orchestrate the larger issues in our lives. Um, The bigger questions of, you know, for George and I, what are we going to do? What does the future hold? You know, um, how how can we serve him? Um, What do we do day to day? Um, He's trustworthy. So I just want to take a moment. Uh, Let's see. We got a few minutes. Um, And I just wanted to ask you guys to kind of group up in groups of two or three. preferably not with your spouse. Um, And I want you to pray specifically for each other that that you would encounter God this week um, in some way, shape, or form, that you would encounter him in a powerful way, that he would reveal himself to you as the living God. Um, So let's just take a few minutes and pray for each other, and then we'll come back for communion.